Good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing this fine day? Hello to some of my uh, folks I see uh, check in once in a while. Uh, we got uh, uh, Nick and Olivier, and uh, I see uh, Elizabeth, and uh, see who are some of the others. I see Teresa, uh, good morning, uh, and uh, Kevin possibly. And uh, so if uh, you have to be on this morning, good morning. And let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, I just want to, I want to lift up in prayer all my fellow, uh, uh, all my fellow community, my fellow Christians, and my fellow church members, all my brothers and sisters in Christ, and this that uh, you can be with them today and help them through whatever is, uh, is uh, either uh, blessing them or whatever is uh, challenging them today, that you'll be with them and give them comfort and uh, wisdom. And we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I labeled this one, uh, uh, we're in uh, Luke 5. I try to do 27 to 39. It's a little bit on the lengthy side, but uh, uh, I think it might be, I might be surprising myself too. I have this uh, verse thing that <laughs> I put my verses up in. And I can usually tell by the number of verses how long it'll take me to read it. Plus, I have some stuff to read, too. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Now I may cut it short, but we'll see. And uh, again, uh, realize also that always that uh, uh, these things are recorded so that uh, after the fact, I put them up on uh, up on YouTube and also up on our website. I sometimes get a little behind on the website. Cause it takes, uh, I sometimes get behind a couple of days, uh, but I try hard to get them up that same day. So you can always go back and, and uh, if you have, can't watch the whole thing, uh, you can come back at a later time and finish. And on Facebook, too. It's under the videos tab. And if you ever need help finding it, uh, the best place to, to always find any of the videos is actually on the website. Because uh, there's a link to the YouTube page. And the YouTube page is nice only because it's in... Uh, it's in order, and it's all the sermons, whether they're coming from Pastor Sakuros or from me. Uh, uh, the uh, Bible teachings are all up there, and uh, including uh, last night's uh, uh, Christmas special by the uh, Academy. Oh, that was awesome! Came off really well. Hopefully, you get a chance to catch that. So, this is what Jesus calls Matthew, uh, and his name. Uh, uh, his other name is Levi, and it was quite common, too, that uh, particularly you might have a Hebrew name and a Roman name uh, and or a, uh, uh, a name given to you. Uh, and I most believe that Levi might have been his uh, his uh, Hebrew name and Matthew maybe his Greek name, but I'm not sure. I didn't try to look that part up. So let's get into it. You see our picture today. We're going to uh, first off talk about uh, the calling of uh, of uh, Matthew, and then we're going to talk about the Pharisees uh, questioning some of the things that Jesus was doing and his response. And he follows up with a parable uh, that you'll see in this painting. And we'll start reading here in uh, in Luke five twenty seven. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi. Uh, if you remember yesterday, we left off where uh, Jesus was just uh, walking along. Uh, this account is actually also in Matthew, or in his own account, Matthew 9, 9 to 15. And I might touch base on a couple of verses out of both of these references, but I'm not going to read them because they're, they're very, very close to the same. There wasn't a lot said about Matthew. And also over in Mark 2, 13 through 20. Uh, there I'm going to mention a few things at the beginning because uh, Mark 13 and 14, I think it is, uh, have a little bit of more information uh, that isn't in Luke. And so uh, I thought I'd mention, uh, so, what is a, uh, so what is a publican? A publican was a position uh, that was uh, typically held, uh, and I got a little... Uh, little brief paragraph here that I brought up. Uh, 
basically in that particular world, in the Roman world, uh, a publican was a uh, uh, was employed by the collectors of Roman revenue, and the Roman Senate Senate uh, farmed the vectigilia, uh, which is translated direct taxes, and the uh, portum or custom taxes to capitalists who undertook to pay and give some into the treasury and the publicum. And so received the name of uh, publicani. Uh, contracts of this uh, kind fell naturally into the hands of uh, the elite, uh, uh, richest class of the Romans. And they would appoint managers who, un, uh, who were under them and the actual custom house officers. So this would be where Matthew comes in. Uh, who examined each bale of goods, exported or imported, assessed its value more or less arbitrarily, and wrote out a ticket and enforced payment. Now, the latter was commonly na natives of the province they lived in, uh, so that uh, we know that Matthew was from Copernicum, and that's where his station was. And they were brought uh, daily into contact with all classes of the population. The name Publicani was used popularly and the New Testament exclusively of uh, Porteries. The system was essentially a uh, vicious one. Uh, the Porteries were encouraged in the most uh, uh, fictitious or fraudulent ex uh, exactions, and a remedy was all but impossible. In other words, they would, whatever they charged, uh, there was no way of uh, disputing it, and basically what it's saying. They overcharged whenever they had an opportunity I got reference of this over in Luke 3.13, uh, where uh, John the Baptist makes reference about this. He's answering a publican. Uh, it says, Master, what shall we do? And this is uh, John's response. And he said unto them, exact no more than what is appointed to you. So here John is making note that uh, not to uh, get a scrag it because it's pretty common for publicans to take in a little extra money. Kind of like the old idea of the uh, uh, the, the uh, deli guy that put his finger on the scale to try to get a little extra money for that pound of meat. <clears throat> so they would try to overcharge whenever they whenever they could, and also they brought false charges of smuggling, so that people trying to sneak things in or get past them, uh, in hope of extorting hush money. Uh, and we see this over in uh, Luke 19. Uh, eight and nine. And here, uh, this is the famous story of Zacchaeus. Uh, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, he's talking to Jesus here, Behold, Lord, that half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restored him fourfold. Uh, so he's kind of admitting here, this is when Zacchaeus became a Christian and started following Jesus, and what he was, his remedy was going to be for all the, uh, the false things he did. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Uh, so that uh, Jesus basically forgave Zacchaeus here. Uh, and Zacchaeus, to try to make restitution, was going to give back fourfold what uh, basically he took by uh, uh, stealing. But just the, just the fact that a publican would actually accuse somebody uh, typically would get them... Uh, some extra money on the side to say, uh, well, if you keep it quiet, uh, then I won't, uh, then I won't, uh, if you give me a little extra money here and uh, I'll uh, kind of forget uh, or not notice that you went by uh, without paying your tax. So it was a, another way of extortion, basically. Uh, it was the barest of all livelihoods. All this was enough to bring this class into ill favor everywhere. Yeah. In Judea and Galilee, uh, they were special circumstances of aggravation. The employment brought out all the best-setting vices of the Jewish character, the strong feeling of many Jews as to the absolute unlawfulness of paying tribute at all made matters worse. The scribes who discussed this question uh, over in Matthew 22:15. let me just show you that. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And so this is a... a Another uh, way the Pharisees were trying to uh, to uh, confuse Jesus. There was a well-known technique, is what it was basically saying. For the most part, answered it in the negative. In addition, 
uh, to other faults, accordingly, the publicans of the New Testament were regarded as traitors and apostates, defiled by their frequent intercourse with the heathen, willing tools of the oppressor, the class thus practically uh, excommunicated, furnished some of the earliest disciples, both of the Baptists of our Lord and the position of Zacchaeus as chief among the publicans. Uh, I just read that one. But again, uh, this is uh, a reference to that in Luke 19 too. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Uh, so he was like, like he was in charge of all the publicans of that area. Implies a graduation of some kind among the persons thus employed. So I guess you can move up in the uh, order of publican and become like in charge of, a, of an area. Uh, other than that, uh, we don't know a whole lot about Matthew. And as a matter of fact, even within the Gospel of Matthew, he doesn't talk about himself much. Uh, now, tradition holds it, and uh, a lot of these came by uh, oral, uh, what they call oral words. Uh, I know the Catholic Church was big on that. Uh, they would uh, write a lot of stuff down that came out of the oral traditions. Uh, and uh, so the only thing that we really know about Matthew, uh, the, the tradition says he died a martyr in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, we also noticed that of Mathis, that was that one disciple that was picked after Judas died uh, as the 12th disciple in Acts. Uh, so those are the two, they might have gotten together and gone to Ethiopia to minister and that uh, they both died there as martyrs. So that, uh, that's the only thing we really know about him other than uh, Other than uh, what we what we read right here, that he was a publican, and quite a few places they reference him as a publican. Okay, back to Luke five twenty eight. So uh, now Jesus had called him, and immediately this is impressive because I realize that uh, I, I kind of like how that show I like watching the chosen uh, depicted this. Is that uh, up to this point? Uh, Matthew might have been noticing this Jesus in, in around town because he, he was in Copernicum and was probably noticing him and some of the miracles he was doing. Maybe he was noticing him. But as soon as Jesus, so he might have been deep in thought or being led by the Holy Spirit uh, to uh, uh, to follow Jesus. And so was, at the moment that Jesus actually said to him, follow me, uh, he immediately left, rose up and followed him. And he just left his post and went to follow Jesus. And this is the part in Mark, uh, our, let me just finish reading this uh, section. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. And I wanted to mention this part over in Mark. Uh, talking about this, uh, that uh, immediately after he had called, Jesus actually, uh, uh, Levi actually, or Matthew, uh, invited him into his home uh, to have dinner, him and his disciples. And we know that we had uh, at least four disciples so far. Uh, that would be uh, Simon, Peter, uh, James, John, and Andrew. Over in Mark 2.13, and here there's a slightly added uh, uh, addition to this part of the story in verses 13 and 14. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude re resorted unto him and he taught them and as he passed by he saw Levi the son of Alphaeus sitting at the receipt of custom and said unto him follow me and he arose and followed him so here we learn two things one I sound like he may have been really close to the seaside area uh, that's where he where Jesus saw him and then he was uh, his father's name was Alphaeus and you'll see that other places he'll be referenced as uh, uh, Levi son of Alphaeus Okay, back to, back to Luke 5.30. Okay, this is where the tri, the, uh, the, uh, the Pharisees have been uh, following along, kind of listening in, and uh, they got something they want to say now. I can imagine that uh, what I've seen depicted in movies and things is that, uh, that uh, Levi is in, uh, has all the disciples and probably some other fellow publicans and giving them, uh, serving them dinner at his home and the Pharisees overhear it, and they're, they're looking for reasons to accuse Jesus of being not who he claims to be, I think. And so uh, they, they, they notice that Jesus is with them. So they're going to make some accusations. 
But the scribe, but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered, saying unto them, They that are whole, whole need not a physician, but they that they are that are sick. <clears throat> I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And I found it interesting that uh, anytime Jesus is dealing with uh, uh, with the uh, Pharisees, it seems like uh, it seems to know that they don't really believe in God. They just like being in power. They like their position. They don't really know the word uh, word of God uh, because uh, I get the impression that Jesus is always calling them out. Uh, just about every time he talks to them. And so I think he knows in the back of his mind that these men will probably never, ever be followers of his. Now, we know there's exceptions because uh, uh, Nicodemus is a great example of an exception. And I'm sure there was plenty of others. But in general, the Pharisees and, and Sadducees, as we'll see, uh, as you see in some of the other verses, are always put down by Jesus as being uh, more and more into uh, their power and their and and their visibility and and uh, being you know high and mighty type of uh, situation. I'm gonna see a verse here in a minute that uh, shows that off really well. So here we see that uh, too that uh, uh, that Jesus is really indicating that uh, to be a follower of His, you have to be humble. Uh, and you can't be somebody who's constantly uh, accusing others of not of not doing things correctly. And I know that's a weakness that I can I, I can attest to at times. Uh, I try to learn as much as I can about the Bible and point things out that I think that maybe people are doing that are incorrect. Uh, but sometimes I get kind of passionate about it. But over in Matthew uh, 9, 12 and 13, Jesus speaks about this again about the physician. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that, be need, who, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and, no, and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And it's an interesting way of putting that, because uh, I think that the Pharisees consider themselves not sinners. Uh, and they consider themselves righteous. And uh, I think Jesus is kind of alluded, uh, saying here that uh, we're all you you're all sinners, and so he's calling the sinners to repentance because there's nobody righteous. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think as Paul says that there's, there's no no one righteous, no not one. So obviously we know that Jesus here is not saying that they are righteous, uh, but that basically he's saying to them that uh, you think you're righteous, but you're not. Uh, some other references to this over in Luke 18, 10 through 14. <clears throat> this is the reference I was talking about. We'll see it again when we get to Luke 18. But two men went up, and this is Jesus speaking. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes for all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. And so uh, basically what Jesus is saying is that uh, that Pharisee, uh, he's floating his own boat. And that's not as we should be. We should, should come humbly to the uh, cross and that we should be willing to uh, realize that we are sinners and not to boast. <clears throat> the best kind of praise always is when praise comes from someone else and not from yourself. Uh, then it's called pride. And pride can be uh, a very dangerous area. Also in Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 24, 47. <coughs> and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Uh, 
old age Jesus is speaking. Now we're going to jump into the Old Testament too in Isaiah 5, Isaiah 55, uh, 6 through 8. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and be our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. There's a really important aspect to remember too that uh, you know, sometimes we wonder what God's doing, but uh, uh, it's 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 important to realize that God doesn't make mistakes. So that everything he does is for a reason. And even though sometimes it uh, definitely doesn't seem like uh, he's uh, got our best interest in mind, he always does. Uh, and, I, and I've had to really try hard not to allow that to bother me either. The other thing I wanted to mention is that we mentioned that, uh, just to review, so I went through a lot of stuff. Uh, where is it? We had left uh, Luke 5.32. I think I forgot to put some verses in here first. Yeah. Let me add them in here real quick. Luke 5, 33. Oh, it's way down there. Why don't I put it down there? It should be here. Okay. Okay, we're fixed. He's had in the wrong spot. Okay, Luke 5, 33. And they said unto him, why do the disciples, uh, this is the Pharisees talking again, uh, trying to catch Jesus up. Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. And uh, I wanted to take a couple of minutes because I honestly have never really studied fasting from a biblical standpoint and I try to understand it better. So I hear this all the time, prayer and fasting. And honestly, I have never felt the confliction, you know, the uh, the feeling that uh, I should be fasting. And I wonder why, because it bothers me a little bit uh, that it doesn't. And I started, after I read through some of this, I started to understand better uh, that it actually Maybe I've, I understood it incorrectly, and that it actually is not, it's mentioned in more in the New Testament. It's not mentioned really in the Old Testament. But when it is, it's kind of like, you always assume it means uh, going without food. Uh, and that's not really what its intention was. Uh, it was about a time to de really uh, dedicate yourself to uh, you and the Lord and not have any, any kind of outside influences. Uh, that uh, I keep hearing this term of fasting and prayer. And honestly, uh, so I found this great article, and it mentions a lot of the Old Testament and a little bit of the New Testament, uh, and how it uh, how it's depicted in the Bible. So I want to run through it real quick. And uh, the word in, uh, in the Greek is called to some, uh, and it never occurs in the uh, Pentateuch. It's never it's not in the Mosaic Law at all, though directly. Uh, uh, immediately the, the foods, uh, it mentions about foods you should not eat, but it never says to not eat. Uh, and to be shunned never enjoys fasting. The, fa uh, the false uh, abstinence, so-called in the East, was carefully avoided. Uh, matter of fact, yeah, there's only, uh, even though they, they talked a lot this way, they didn't always practice it. On the yearly day of atonement, uh, that was one of the feasts, uh, or not the non-feast, I should say, the Day of Atonement. It's the tenth day of the seventh month. Uh, Israelites were directed to afflict the soul. That was the direct response, and it's actually in Leviticus 16. I want to read through it so you can see it. 
starting in verse 29. And there shall be a statue for every unto you that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. Also in uh, Leviticus 23, 27. Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, thou shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy conv convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Numbers 30, 13 also mentions it. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul, her husband may establish it or her husband may make it void. Uh, so again, this was something that uh, it's about afflicting the soul. And so I think it's basically saying is that you give up something. And I've heard this before. You actually give up some and you, and you dedicate that particular period of time uh, to uh, seeking the Lord's guidance on something. So it goes on to say in this little uh, brief article about it, the significant term implies that the essence of scriptural fasting lies in self humiliation and penance, and that the precise mode of subduing the flesh to the spirit and of expressing sorrow for sin is left to the conscientious discretion of each person. Uh, one reference in the New Testament in Acts 27, 9, alludes to this a little bit. Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. Now here Paul uses the term fasting, and it's, and it's about this period. He, had, he was trying to, uh, I guess he had been in Jerusalem and he was going by ship. This is when, during one of his journeys in that storm. And here he makes reference to the uh, that that period of time has passed, uh, and uh, and here Paul calls it the fast. It's one of the first times I guess that they called it the fast. But it was actually the proper term would be afflicting the soul if you go by the Pentateuch. But also realize that God, not discounting uh, outward acts of sorrow, expressed of inward penance. Uh, over in Isaiah 58, 4 through 7. Got an interesting take on it also. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Uh, that verse basically saying is that uh, uh, I'm not necessarily impressed by you fasting. Uh, that's not the, that's the, that's what I get from that voice. Don't do it because you think that I'm telling you to do it. It is such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man be it to afflict his soul is to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes unto him. Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Okay, God's asking a question there. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free? And you break every yoke. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul, as that term again, afflict the soul, her husband may establish it. Okay, that was weird. Why did it go to Numbers? I mean, Isaiah. Oh, this thing's doing some weird things. Okay, it's 58.6. That's 58.7. My program was doing something weird. Uh, verse 58.7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring thy poor that thou cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? couple other references uh, compared to uh, similar uh, warnings against uh, mistaking outward fasting as merit, uh, mater, uh, meritorious before God. That was uh, 
I think people in a lot of ways get some of this stuff kind of mixed up. Uh, Malachi 3.14. Ye have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? So whenever you see the word vain, it means that you're doing it out of some kind of pride. Also in uh, Matthew 6.16. Moreover, uh, and this is a really good verse too. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad continence, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they, they have their reward. But thou, when thou uh, fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So I think what's basically saying here is that uh, uh, this is a private affair between you and God. And it, uh, if you feel that you need to uh, spend some time with the Lord, you should just eliminate all distractions from you and concentrate on the Lord. Uh, and uh, but the article I was reading goes on to say that, interestingly enough, fasting is not really mentioned in the Old Testament as a requirement, more of a period to put your focus on the Lord. Uh, I can remember myself that uh, there's been periods of time that I really felt led to, to spend. Uh, I didn't have any interest in any outside activities except seeking the Lord's guidance on something. And so I just kind of dedicated that period of time, whatever it happened to be, uh, to, uh, to focusing on what I needed to uh, petition the Lord for. And this is done in secret. And I think I even mentioned a couple of days ago that uh, you know, when you pray, you should go into your closet. It shouldn't be something openly and uh, and like uh, uh, pray to the Lord and gain and gain an understanding and fellowship with the Lord. I remember myself that uh, now that I look back, there's probably a couple of times I can remember that I guess theoretically I fasted. Uh, it was a couple of really low times in my life when I was, uh, I might have mentioned that uh, as a testimony back in 2015. Uh, I think of it because it was the first week of December, so it was fairly recent, uh, seven years ago. And that I was really, really down and my heart was giving me a lot of problems. And I was just really concentrating on trying to figure out what the Lord wanted me to do. And uh, I went through a really uh, tough time where I realized now that I, I actually went two or three days without eating. And it wasn't because I intentionally decided not to eat. Uh, because I didn't, I had no interest in eating. Uh, that I just had an interest in seeking the Lord. And I can think of other times too that that's happened. And so... Now I'm starting to get a little different approach of what they mean by fasting and prayer. Is that when we get so intensely involved uh, with the Lord to, to, to seek his guidance, that we just kind of push out all those other things that uh, can influence us and we concentrate on him. And that, I guess, is what they call fasting. It might mean eliminating food. It might mean just spending time in prayer and not really uh, seeking some of the uh, the joys of life and uh, uh I've heard that that mentioned too that you eliminate some kind of activity that uh, that uh, is just a uh, a fun thing to do and to concentrate on seeking the Lord's guidance on stuff. So that's my take on it. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, at least in my study here that uh, I kind of felt led to kind of share that of what I found when I was studying it. And we're already past a half hour, and I got about eight more verses, so I'll probably be another five minutes. Give you an idea. Okay, back to Luke 5.33. This is where we left off. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. I like Jesus' response. And he said unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? And I love that analogy that the Lord uses. And he goes on. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and they shall then, they fast in these days. And as I read that better, it, it, is that when we're, when we're in tune with the Lord, uh, when we need, when he's with us, that we really don't need uh, to seek him. And that, and that uh, uh, when we feel uh, alone, and that uh, the bridegroom is no longer with us. And that's when we need to seek uh, to, to fast. And I thought I'd just make a couple of the uh, comments about, uh, I've heard it heard many times that uh, people say that uh, 
this analogy of uh, us being the uh, bride of Christ isn't in the Bible. Well, you saw it there in Luke, I alluded to it, and over in John 3.29, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. That was John the Baptist. And over in uh, Ephesians 5.25, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So here's that analogy too that Christ is the uh, is the husband, uh, future husband of uh, us as uh, the bride of Christ. Back to Luke, uh, verse 36, and he spoke also a parable unto them: No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old, if otherwise then both the new make a rent and the piece that was taken out of the new agreed not with the old. I think I finally understand these parables. I never did up to this point. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway deserve new, for he saith the old is better. So that's what our picture here is depicting. Uh, here we have the, uh, the feast that uh, Jesus was having uh, with his disciples and with his new disciple, Matthew, and the other publicans that joined in. And this is that parable that we were just talking about. And now I think I understand that. I read a commentary uh, by one of the uh, one of my favorite uh, pastors, uh, Chuck, uh, it was uh, uh, J. Vernon McGee. My father grew up uh, listening to his radio programs. I've, learned to like him a lot since I've started reading some of his stuff. And he explained it to me, and it may, now it makes more sense to me. Uh, and basically what Jesus is saying here is that uh, Jesus has come uh, to present a new covenant uh, to the world and not to try to take the old covenant of the Mosaic law and apply it to the uh, new covenant which Jesus is bringing uh, because he's, he's come to fulfill the law. Uh, and he says that quite commonly. And he used that analogy of you don't take new wine and pour it into old uh, wineskins. And that's what's happening over here. If you do, then it's going to burst. Now it's a natural phenomenon because actually wine ferments as it, uh, as it sits. And the wineskins, that's why they use wineskins, as, they, as a, a new wineskin will expand as the gases on the inside expand during the fermenting process. And then... Uh, uh, if you use the old wineskins, the old wineskins have already expanded from the new wine it had before. And so now this new wine is going to make them burst. Uh, and so I think the analogy here, too, is what Jesus is saying is that if we try to take the old uh, uh, the old covenant, of the, in this case, the old wineskin, and try to pour this new one into it and make it fit, it's not going to, it's just going to burst. And so it's important to take his new covenant uh, the covenant of the church, basically, uh, and that, uh, and to a, and and not to try to fit the old covenant into it, and so that makes a lot more sense to me now. And I hope it uh, that that explanation helps a little bit. Uh, And that basically they, that Jesus was going to die, uh, be buried, and, and raise again on the third day, according to the scriptures. Uh, and that was the fulfillment of the uh, law uh, that was uh, all the all the prophecies leading up to that point about him, that he was going to become that new wine. Uh, he was the new way, because now because he fulfilled that requirement of somebody dying on the cross and becoming a savior for us, uh, that uh, he now through the Holy Spirit will be pouring into us as a new creature. And I think that's where that term comes from. We are here, <clears throat> I think it's in John 3.16 area. Let me turn to it real quick. That just popped in my head and I want to read it. Whenever the Holy Spirit does that to me, I know there's a reason he's doing it. So, Actually starts in uh, 
find it here. I think that's where it's at. Got what I was really talking about. I forgot what I was uh, trying to drive at. Okay, never mind. It was something I read that I thought I wanted to mention. But anyways, Jesus fulfilled the law uh, as spoken of. Uh, I was lost my train of thought. So I guess maybe it wasn't the Holy Spirit. That doesn't happen when it's the Holy Spirit. Okay. Well, if it comes to me later, I'll uh, mention it tomorrow. <clears throat> so, let's end with a word of prayer. That's it for chapter 5. And, uh, dear Heavenly Father, oh, praise you, Father, and thank you so much, Lord. Uh, and if, I was, if there was something else, Lord, you wanted me to say, could you please help me remember what it was? Uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, something came to my mind, and now it left again. So I give you praise and thanks, and for all you do, in Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Okay. Well, it's not coming to me, so uh, I will talk to you all again tomorrow. And uh, I will, uh, oh, no, actually, no, tomorrow's uh, Saturday. So I will uh, see you Sunday, and we'll get back into Chapter 6 uh, starting uh, Monday. So we'll talk to you then. Have a great day.